Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, in this session, we want to talk about monitoring and getting insights from a SWIFT cluster. And this is obviously a hot topic. This came up in a talk from HP on Monday, another talk from Symantec. Um, I'm assuming that many of you were in Christian's talk just before lunch. Um, and we want to take you basically through our experiences, through you know, some stories of what we've done in trying to monitor, diagnose, and get some insights from some SWIFT clusters where we were doing some work for, for customers um, with the hope that this can be useful in our approaches, our methods, and, and, and the way we went through this can help others to try to understand the SWIFT cluster. I'm going to be presenting on Michael along with Dima. Hi. Um, and this is work that we've done also with uh, your own Weinsberg and George Goldberg from, from our lab. Um, now, may put this work into context. Um, Dima, can you fix it? Put this work into context. Um, you know, one of the reasons we're interested in SWIFT is that SWIFT deals you know, enables a hybrid cloud, right? And, and, you know, one of the things we're really interested in is being able to deploy in a on-prem model, a dedicated hosted model, and in a public cloud model. And in all of these models, all these deployment models, it's important to be able to get an understanding, a sense of uh, how the cluster is working. And if there's issues, what are the issues in that cluster? Um, and we also need to be able to figure out a way to get a set of insights into how our presentation is not working. Um, so it doesn't present. So I'll keep talking while you don't see the slides. Um, monitoring is fairly easy if you're in a simple system. So if you think about a car, right? You know, a car is a fairly easy thing to monitor. It has a few set of dials. It has a speedometer, a tachometer, you know, maybe a temperature gauge. It's fairly easy to get a sense of what's going on in the car. You want to know how fast you're going, you look at the speedometer. It shows 100. You've got your information, right? When you have four gauges, getting insights out of those four gauges is fairly easy. Now, Swift is really simple to use, but it's not a simple system, right? You know, under the covers, there's a lot of complexity there. It has a lot of gauges. And when you want to get insights out of all of these gauges, when you have 100 gauges, 200 gauges, that's a lot harder, right? How do you know what to correlate with what? How do you know which information is relevant to which information? Um, and you know, that's really where we're trying to focus. And there's been a lot of, you know, work done. Uh, and if we ever get the slides up, or you know, later when the slides go online, you'll see there's, you know, lots of information on how to get monitoring data from SWIFT. And you can get lots of great data. But once you have that data, what do you do with it? How do you get insights? How do you drive that data to get you, you know, have some insight and some sense and make sense of this huge, massive data? So what we're looking at is how to take advantage of a set of open source tools. And you know, for those of you who were in Christian's talk uh, earlier, you probably heard about, you know, you, you heard about some of these. Um, and use these tools to gain insights. And so in particular, what we're looking at is, okay, we have a Swift cluster, and we take advantage of StatsD to collect, you know, hundreds, you know, plus data points from within Swift. Uh, you know, Collecti, which is pulling that from, from StatsD, as well as pulling in the underlying system data, you know, memory, CPU, et cetera. Uh, and then we ship this data off both to Graphite and to an Elk stack, you know, Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana. Uh, once we have the data over there, we are able to look at it graphically, but then we also take advantage of Spark, Apache Spark, which is a big data analytics platform to do analytics on the data, try to get a deeper insight into the data. 
And one more thing we've done is we've developed our own piece of custom middleware, which we call Request Stopper. It's a piece of middleware that's only useful for diagnostic. It's not something you would ever run in a production cluster because it actually stops requests from coming through. But it enables you to diagnose and see where the overheads are in processing a uh, request. So that's sort of the context of where we're working. Um, and as I said, you know, we, we're looking at Swift because it's something where we can work with customers, where we work with customers in various configurations. And in particular, you know, we had a customer that we were working with. This customer was dealing with relatively small objects, 15K objects, right? You know, often people think Swift is storing lots of very large objects. You know, those of you who were in HP's presentation on, I guess it was Monday morning, uh, you know, saw their average uh, size was relatively small. Symantec on Monday talked about, you know, looking at 16K objects. So, you know, objects of this scale are not uncommon. This customer had a use case where they had 15K objects. And, you know, what they were interested in was, you know, being able to create 1,000 objects a second, right? And so what, you know, we did was I went to Dima and, you know, the others on the team and basically said, okay, what size cluster do we need to get, to be able to create 1,000 objects a second? Um, and... Okay. <laughs> and... You know, basically what we want to talk through is, you know, Dima's and the team's experience of trying to answer that question and, you know, a few other questions and what they had to go through in order to try to understand the system behavior to be able to answer that question. Okay. <laughs> As you see, it's hard to understand the system behavior. <laughs> well, so the first thing that I asked from Michael to get some hardware to run the, the test on it, and I got three proxy machines, uh, seven storage nodes reaching uh, hard disks and uh, SSD drives, <coughs> and also 256 giga RAM uh, and 10 gigabit network. And uh, I did my first test uh, by using the Cosbench. Uh, Cosbench is uh, an Intel uh, cloud object store benchmark tool, and I got 520 operations in a second. I said, okay, it's a good start point, now I need just to multiply it. But uh, I couldn't scale up, scale up my uh, cluster because then I need uh, more hardware. So I decided to try to scale it down to find at which point my performance reduce, and then I will found, oh, this is my daughter. <laughs> okay, uh, and then I w would understand w what I need uh, to increase to get the 1,000 operations that I need. So the first thing, I reduce the number of proxies, I set one proxy instead of three, did the, the, the benchmark, and got exactly the same number. Then I reduced the amount of object nodes, and performance doesn't change much. I reduced the number of disks, and got the same number. And then I said, stop, you are doing something wrong. Let's see inside. Let's understand how Swift works. So we have number of layers at Swift, and first one is the proxy. It gets all the put requests from the user, and then for each put request, it creates three another requests to the object servers to create the three replicas. In general case, it's our replicas, but I would uh, speak about our use case. There we have three replicas. And then each object storage node writes its data locally on the disk and also updates the container server. It's done asynchronously. It's almost asynchronously because object server waits 
half a second to the response from the container server, and if it doesn't get this response, it writes a async pending object locally, and then at the background, uh, object updater uh, would take this async pending and update the container with the relevant data. Okay, so after we got the time uh, out or we got the response from the container server, object <coughs> server would return to the proxy and then if proxy got the quorum, at our case it's two successful responses for, for, from the object server, it returns acknowledge to the user. So if I want to understand where is my bottleneck, I can try to remove, uh, to replace the current servers by the dummy servers that do nothing but catch the re uh, request and immediately respond with the success response. So if I remove all the container servers and put the dummy, I would reduce all the, the async pending stuff, then I would put it uh, instead the object servers and I would see how costly it was to write uh, the data to my disks uh, and to update the container. Then I can put it to the proxy and to measure the round trip network from the client to the proxy. But of course it doesn't useful for the production, but it's very useful for the analysa and for bottleneck, uh, bottleneck finding. Okay, so we don't want to rewrite now all the servers, so Gil Wernick, he's sitting here in the first row, he helps us, he implemented a very simple middleware, you can find it uh, at uh, his GitHub, it's 12 or something like that lines of code. And this middleware can be uh, inserted to the pipeline at proxy object server or uh, container server. And then we would get this uh, behavior that I talked uh, before. So when we got this middleware, we start to make the measurements. First, uh, first of all, we did the measurement of the vanilla Swift. Uh, it looks like it works now. Uh, yeah, I will move it. Okay, great. Okay, the, the, the full screen doesn't work. Uh, but you can see now the numbers that we got when we did the measurement of the vanilla Swift. Uh, the, the Swift version that I'm talking about, uh, it's uh, 1.30 because the story starts at the September previous year, as Michael uh, says. And I got 192 milliseconds. Then I put uh, my, uh, uh, my middleware to the container server and I got 43 milliseconds and I uh, move it up to the object server proxy, got all these numbers, I put them together and this is the chart that uh, I observed. We can see that container server uh, takes the majority of the response time and now the question is why? Uh, we looked into the code and found that uh, container server has a lock on the directory and then when the, 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 the directory the, uh, is locked to update the SQLite database, another uh, writes couldn't update the container. So we found how we can resolve this problem, how we can to reduce the overhead of this uh, lock and how we can to do it easily without change in a Swift code, only for our m m measurement needs. 
and uh, we decided to run 100 containers instead one container. So then I would distribute my log to m many containers and not all of them would be logged together. And we observed that running the same workload with same amount of objects with 100 containers is almost five times better than one container. And we see that uh, the container part is also uh, reduced to nothing. Okay, but uh, t time is g going and uh, we have a new Swift release 2.2, so what we can get on it? We uh, this is the problem that uh, yeah, because I have all this in animation and uh, it's much more cooler. Uh, okay, so uh, as we see, the native Swift 2.2 is already three times faster than the previous version, and we see that the most improvement uh, was done at the container part, but we, uh, we still see the 1.5 factor improvement when we use 100 containers. So we checked the code, what is the difference uh, between uh, Swift 2.2 and the previous version, and uh, we found that indeed there was a container merge item pa uh, patch that uh, makes the huge difference. So thank you to community that you did uh, this great work. But still, after this great improvement, we still have a factor of 1.5 potential improvement that container sharding can produce, can produce because instead of one container uh, uh, spreading the, the objects to the 100 containers makes the performance improvement. Okay, so now when I have my Swift 2.2 or a container sharding or I just can ask from client to put the data at 100 containers instead uh, in a single one, my response time is okay and now I can achieve the Michael's requirements of 1,000 objects in a second, but there was additional requirement the, reason, uh, the response time should be reasonable, okay? What does it mean? 45 milliseconds on average. Is it reasonable? On average, yes. But what is going in the worst case? Okay, to answer to this question, we can use Kibana. We can get the histogram that represents the percentiles of the, the requests and it looks like that. Then 60% of the data is very fast. But on another hand, we still have some requests, for example, 1% of requests that take more than one and a half second each one. So we try to understand why it happened and uh, then we took the graphite and looked inside on the response time based on the timeline. And uh, we observe two behaviors. This is the same data, but the upper chart represents it uh, by a moving average per minute interval. Okay, so it's uh, less noisy. And uh, the uh, lower chart represents it at the one second granularity. And the first thing that we can observe that the upper graph has a slope. And it's a bad slope, it's going up. And it's not something that uh, was running at background. We return these runs many times and we see that it's going up continuously all the time. And we think that uh, uh, the 
temp direct, uh, the XFS temp directory bug that uh, was opened before three weeks is uh, relative to this behavior and uh, we hope at the moment that the patch for this bug uh, was, would be available to rerun this test and to see the flat line. But another behavior that we observed that we have very noisy chart and we have some peaks each 30 seconds. So we zoom in. It's also the same chart, but now I am to, uh, looking not on the hour interval, but only on 10 minutes. And we see that most of the responses are very fast. The response time is awesome, but we still have some peaks each 30 seconds. We start to dig to, to understand what, uh, what is going in because probably I have one response that's stuck somewhere and uh, it takes a lot of time and then it takes all the response time up. So at this point we used Spark. We took the proxy logs and we uh, filtered all the responses that took more than half second. And this is how it looks like. You see that it's not a one request. There are bunches of requests and we still see the 30 second interval between these bunches. So where it's came from? We found that there is a, a XFS SYNCD parameter that is also 30 seconds uh, and it is responsible for the flushing the XFS <coughs> data, the XFS metadata, to the disk. We start to play with this number. We put one minute, five minutes, and we observe that our peaks really moved. The interval between them changed, and also the height of these peaks was changed. So one observation that we can make from all the, the, this story that there is some XFS background activity that harms our Swift performance. But uh, we can maybe tune it somehow. For example, if the most important thing is uh, for our use case is a uh, average time and 100 percentile is uh, not interesting because we are providing 99% uh, SLA or something like that, we can increase this parameter and get better response time, better 99% at price of the 100% performance degradation. Okay. Uh, and now we can swap to the story number two. At this story, uh, I want to present uh, how we are looking on uh, uh, our Swift cluster based on uh, the, 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 the tool that we the, the tools that we described previously. Specifically, at this story, I am mainly using the graphite. So. It's another cluster here. I have two proxy, four object uh, nodes, uh, less hard disk, less SSD. Uh, now I run my uh, container and account on another uh, servers, also with SSD. This is uh, how the cost bench uh, summary of the workload looks like. You can see that uh, I did a one hour workload that started at uh, 5.40 at the morning. Uh, th the performance that I got was at the prepare uh, something like thir uh, 30 megabytes and 21 megabytes uh, at the main workload. So what the first thing we are doing after we uh, run the cost bench stuff, we are checking that the data 
that we send from the client is equal to what the cost bench reports. This chart represents the throughput that the client machine sent to the proxy. It's the total uh, throughput. And we can see that, indeed, the average is somewhere at 21 megabyte. We also see that there are, uh, there are some spikes. I don't know why they happen. Maybe there is some another not uh, XFS uh, uh, background process that uh, make these spikes, but on average it looks okay. So if I send 21 megabyte, I expect to receive at the proxy 21 megabyte, and this is what I see. Great. So now I want to check what I'm sending from the proxy to the object storage, and I see three times more traffic. Great, we can understand it. We have three replicas. So on each megabyte we got, we sent three megabytes. Everything is clear. So now I want to understand what I get at the storage nodes. So what I sent, that I get, great. And now the question is, what is the traffic to my hard disk? And what we see, the traffic to the hard disk is 12 times higher than what you write to your proxy. On each megabyte that you write to your proxy, you write 12 megabytes to your disk. Of course, it's not the 12 times more data at the end of the day, because some of the data is re rewritten because, for example, I write my object to the temp directory and then I move it to the final directory that represents its partition and I need to update all the inodes and all this stuff locally. And this is the overhead that we observe. Another good news is that it's not multiplicative but additive, so it's 12 times more when the object is small, but if I am taking bigger object, for example, one megabyte object, it's only 3.5 times higher, and uh, it's almost what I expect, because I expect to see three times, because uh, I have three replicas, and I don't want an another jump. Okay, great. So, now we understand that our traffic is, uh, for this is 12 times higher. It's not bad, it's not good, but we need to remember it because when we are planning our cluster, we need to take it to the account that our disk would work hard. Uh, th this is the disk capacity utilization. The f first part is the new object creation. It's going up, it's okay. But then we expect to see it flat because we don't create new objects, we only rewrite them. But we see that we still have some growing and after some time the, 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 the data is going down and then we got the flat state. All this behavior is caused by the async pending. The amount of async pendings that you can write is huge. Okay, if your uh, container server behaves slowly, you would expect to write a lot of data to the disks and the time that takes to clean it is long. It takes something like seven hours to clean the data that I managed to write in one hour workload. Uh, additional thing that uh, we can observe by using uh, graphite is the response time of our servers. So we see the bottom line uh, represents the uh, response time of three hour object server. The yellow and brown line 
represents the proxy, and the upper blue line represents object server. Is it okay? No, because any object server shouldn't be higher than our proxy. If I see such a chart, I understand that there is some problem with my server. So the first thing that we did, we remove the Swift uh, and uh, run the micro bench by using the VD bench tool. And we observed that indeed, we have different performance for our servers. We checked what is going on and we found that object one has also a different hardware. Although we expected that all the nodes should be similar. This was the request for the, that hardware, okay? And by using older hardware, we getting worse performance. Okay, so what we can do? We can remove this bad server. We can reduce our cluster size by 25%. We are reducing CPU, RAM, everything by 25%. And we see 10% improvement at throughput. Okay? So it's important that all the machines at the cluster are good. Otherwise, your overall performance would hurt. So we also hiring. So you can uh, talk with us or with the recruiters that are going at these uh, soccer-like t-shirts. And uh, if you have some questions. And, and apologies for the lack of yeah. a reasonable presentation and the technical difficulties we've had. But are there any questions? It means that everything was clear. Just because we asked. Are we talking uh, about objects mostly 8K or any particular size? I, I didn't see the distribution of object sizes that you're so, putting under the cluster. So in the first story, right, which was a real customer who came to us, it was 15K objects. Right? They actually, what they said was up to 15K. We took it as 15K because, you know. Got it. So it's but this was a very specific customer requirement. But we've seen these small size objects in other places. I mean, if you look at the HP talk. Right, on Monday. On Monday, their average size or the me median size was uh, uh, smaller, you know, than, smaller than, than that even. I don't remember. And you know, Symantec was talking about doing everything with 16K. And so these smaller size objects actually turn out to be quite common. Because you had the 12 times more workload at the back end on a smaller load. Right. Yeah. If right. you have bigger chunks, you're doing close to three times. Yeah, more. exactly. Okay. Exactly. And, uh, uh, and probably it is something that uh, community sh sh should think about and maybe there should be some another pass at the Swift to serve the smaller objects maybe at some another way because uh, f for example now we have the Erasure codes. Yep. What you would do with uh, 50k <laughs> object? I mean, you're talking about slower at a local cluster. Talk about how could how worse it could be across multiple sites if it is. Mm -hmm. So trying to do 12 times over locally is bad. Mm -hmm. Based on your data, you try to do erasure code across multiple sites. Mm -hmm. You're like so, dead. Right. So what's going in with the community with the erasure coding really is intended for cross site. Okay. All right, that, that explains. And uh, you said micro testing. Uh, micro mic benchmark. Micro uh, benchmark with VD bench. I used VD bench reasonably well. You Is micro bench test mark uh, slightly but, different? But, 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 but we call you? it micro benchmark because I am taking one server and run on it, uh, read, write, uh, or any workload, and it's uh, the, not the Swift workload. I check only, for example, the single server performance. This is the reason why I call to it micro benchmark. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Thank guys. Question for your earlier uh, explanation of the how many uh, containers for 
certain objects ingest or those operations are going to affect performance. I just want to know in the production, how you control how many containers will be involved for certain object operations. So, so you know, again, this was a particular customer scenario and part of what we could go back with the customer was how to structure their workload such that they could get maximum performance. I've actually encountered a couple of customers where they're trying to upload you know, hundreds of millions of objects and then the question is, what is the way to organize those into Swift containers such that they can get the maximal performance, right? Now, in general, right, you don't really have control of that. And, and as you, know, you, know, you, you saw, um, as Dima showed, there was a huge improvement in single container performance with 2.2. With, uh, and so it becomes less significant. There still is room. You know, we have a, you know, a 1.5 you know, gain, so you know, 50% improvement potential here um, by spreading stuff out. Um, so it really depends, you know, how much you're trying to optimize. Um, and, you know, as Dima said, and there was a session this morning in the design summit on container sharding that that would sort of put that into Swift and make that transparent as opposed to making the application be aware of it. Thanks. Sure. Any other questions? Can you come to the microphone? Any changes you observed or any updates regarding background processes other than the sink, like scrubbing and peering and that kind of stuff? Have you looked into those aspects? So, so, so in the particular scenarios we were running, we didn't, but um, you know, if you were in Christian's talk, I don't know if you were in the talk just before lunch, right? Christian talked about That's some of these yeah, things. Yeah. And uh, you know, I think it really depends on your workload. And what we just tried to do is work through, you know, walk through our specific experience with specific scenarios. It wasn't an issue in our scenarios. That doesn't mean it isn't an issue necessarily in all cases. Got it. Thank you. Sure. Other questions? Thank you, everyone.